Good evening, and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Craig Freeman. Tonight, we explore the impact of the oil and gas industry on the state's economy. As major oil companies reported record earnings in the months following Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, Louisiana's income from oil and gas took a significant blow. Interrupted production due to the storms could cause the state to lose up to $350 million in anticipated mineral revenues. And in a state with 19% of the country's natural gas reserves, rising natural gas prices may ironically translate into a net loss of jobs. So, is Louisiana, the second largest energy producing state in the country, reaping its, quote, fair share from energy prices? Gas price increases of 40% at the pump and rising utility bills have hit Louisiana residents hard. Industrial consumers have also felt the pinch. In the small town of St. Francisville this past Christmas Eve, 150 of the Timbeck Paper Mill's 700 employees lost their jobs. The culprit, according to Plant Vice President Kent Bloomberg, rising natural gas prices. The, the cost of energy overall is the main factor behind the layoffs. Natural gas prices, electricity prices, which are driven by natural gas, and chemicals, which are driven by oil prices, are all up about $30 million from a year ago. We cut the part of the plant that uses the most electricity. And that ended up having the ripple effect on the, on the people, unfortunately. Tim Beck union leader Keith Tony feels the layoffs will have a significant impact on the region's tax base. This corporation uh, supports the St. Francisville community, the West Feliciana community with tax money. And that tax money is crucial for the good education or the good schools that West Feliciana has. Unfortunately, the Timbeck story is not unique in Louisiana. Despite being the second largest producer of natural gas in the U.S., the state has seen significant industrial downsizing as natural gas prices have tripled over the last five years. Dr. David Dismukes with LSU Center for Energy Studies explains. High prices not, are not necessarily a great thing for the state when you think of how many other industries are supported by oil and gas as resources. Three of your largest users of natural gas are going to be the refining sector, petrochemicals, and paper and pulp, which we have extensively here in Louisiana. You've seen energy costs go up for all three of these sectors over the last year to two years, and we have lost considerably more jobs over the last several years in paper and pulp and in petrochemicals than we have gained in the oil and gas sector. So is Louisiana a winner or loser in the energy game? A 2002 study commissioned by the Louisiana Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association put the overall impact to the state's oil and gas industry at nearly $93 billion. Mid-Continent Vice President for Government Relations Jeff Kopsky explains this figure includes both direct and indirect income. If you can look at taxes, the state budget, income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, uh, severance taxes, royalties, bonuses, it's billions of dollars that, that it provides, not just to the state government, but to local government as well. We're probably one of the largest property taxpayers in the state. In the 80s, 47 percent of the state's total revenues came directly from oil and gas taxes and fees. Today, that figure is closer to 12 percent. Despite their reduced influence, Dismukes says oil and gas revenues have rescued the state in the last several years thanks to higher energy prices. I think one of the, the interesting aspects about oil and gas revenues has been is that they have kind of saved the day in the last several budget cycles we've been through because the collections have been higher than anticipated because prices have been higher. Higher energy prices coupled with tax incentives are making Louisiana an attractive investment again for extraction, according to State Representative William Daniel. We've abated the severance tax on re-entered in oil wells. And that's particularly important considering the age of Louisiana's production. We have, our production is basically in the very mature stage. Our wells have been around for a long time. They're on the decline. However, with the increase in oil and gas prices that we see today, that sparked a lot of interest in coming back and reentering these wells. But the prospect of more oil and gas activity troubles environmental groups. They worry about adding to salinity and hydrologic problems caused by more than 8,000 miles of industrial canals cut through the coastal marsh since the 1950s. Robert Bauman with LSU Center for Energy Studies feels such fears are overstated. There have been some impacts, but they're hard, they're hard to document other than the direct impact of an oil and gas canal with its spall bank 
And when you look at that in terms of the wetland loss problem, that only amounts to about 7% of the wetland loss problem. Uh, so there could be some indirect impacts from those canals. To help fund coastal restoration projects, there has been a renewed push by Louisiana's congressional delegation to recoup a larger share of offshore royalties paid to the federal government. Federal offshore royalties from all oil and gas development on the Outer Continental Shelf total over $7.5 billion. Two-thirds of that amount comes from offshore Louisiana. Bauman says new legislation could prove very profitable to the state. There are a number of proposals in Congress for revenue sharing from federal waters with the coastal states. It includes as much as 50 percent, which for Louisiana would be over $2 billion in additional funds per year. Uh, there's another proposal for Louisiana that instead of a three-mile boundary, that we would have a three-league boundary just like Texas has. That would provide about another $600 million per year. These additional federal monies may or may not be on the horizon for Louisiana. In the meantime, Louisiana's industrial consumers, such as Timbeck, fear what fluctuating energy prices mean for their future. We're concerned that if gas prices don't come down to more historically sustainable levels, this mill will be in long-term trouble. As usual, our audience tonight was selected at random by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. As to political affiliation, 44% of respondents identify themselves as Democrat, 26% as Republican, and 15% as Independent or Other. When it comes to economic issues, 40% say they are economic conservatives, 32% identify as moderate, and 16% say liberal. While the vast majority of respondents, 76%, think that oil companies are making, quote, more than a fair profit as energy prices rise, a large percentage of those surveyed, 64%, feel that higher energy prices will hurt Louisiana more than they will help. 61% of respondents also feel that oil and gas companies contribute to Louisiana's coastal erosion problem. Despite this, 34% of those surveyed say that the state should try to attract more petrochemical jobs, while only half that number, 17%, think Louisiana should seek to diversify its economy by attracting jobs in other areas. So let's start with that. Should we be attracting more oil and gas industry to the state? Why? Or why not? John, what do you think? Do we need to add more incentives to get more oil and gas into the state, or? I think we should do, uh, you know, everything possible in an expedient manner to, to grow what we have here. I, I believe the, uh, the offshore uh, LPG system is very important, and I, and I feel it's important that we move at a, at a fast pace towards that if we're going to keep up with the uh, these rising costs, it, it's, it's important to keep the energy costs down in their state where we're, you know, we're based on petrochemical. So the focus should stay on oil and gas? Yes. Okay. Yes, definitely. Bob? No. <laughs> uh, we're at the end. It's kind of like in 1906 when you're making buggy whips. You were making buggy whips and if you expanded your plant, you got burned. Uh, you look at the oil today. Uh, they can say that we're going to last 20 more years or 30 more years, whatever it is. If you take any major, major uh, investments that it said 20-year payback, uh, your oil and your gas aren't going to be there. Uh, I think Louisiana as a state has got to di diversify. I'm not quite smart enough to tell you where, but I think, I think we're going to have to get away from that pony. We've ridden it for a long time. No, we have ridden it for a long time. Deborah, you think it's time to go? Certainly I do. I agree with uh, Bob. I mean, we're kind of suffering from a lack of vision in the, in the past and a population that unfortunately is, you know, ranks near the bottom of the country in, in terms of an education and that's really figured in. It's hard to make wise choices when the population is not really educated and that's been a real problem. Well, how do we attract other jobs if we have those problems? Well, some of the other states like Tennessee, even Mississippi have outdone us in, in those regards, you know, diversifying our economies and realizing you can't just bank it, as you said, you can't just keep riding the same old pony into the ground. And Louisiana sort of made its uh, fortunes in the past by sort of selling out a lot of our other interests, you know, selling out the environment, selling out peoples, uh, selling out a lot of our other interests. And I think, uh, you know, while we need to support what we have and get the most mileage out of it, we need to look elsewhere. Unfortunately, a lot of the brains, a lot of the minds in the state that could solve these problems leave us for the same problems. So we're sort of in a, a catch-22. Uh, has the state sold out? I mean, did the state sell itself for the, to the oil and gas industry? Robin, what do you think? 
I think that we did sell our state to the oil and gas because that's where we were banking on getting all our money from. And we really had not uh, checked into other ways of uh, getting um, our, um, you know. Getting our money's worth? Do you yeah, think we got our money's worth? Chris, I see you nodding your head. Uh, I think that the, the jobs that were associated with the oil and gas industry were high paying jobs. Uh, most of the workers that went to work in those industries uh, were either high school graduates or high school, I hate to say it, dropouts that were attracted to those high paying jobs. And um, with the situation changing, with the depletion of the oil and natural gas resources, uh, I think that the, we have to diversify the economy uh, to bring in new jobs and uh, higher paying jobs if we can. And that was part of the problem I think that Bob talked about before. How do we replace those high paying petrochemical jobs at all? I mean, can, can we find other industries? Should our state senators add incentives to get those industries here? What do you think those industries may be? Look at the movie industry. I mean, look what's happened there in the New Orleans area. I mean, there's a perfect example. The incentive has brought it in, it's growing, it's burgeoning, it's bringing in loads of money. It's just a perfect example of what can be done with a little <coughs> imagination. And it was resisted for many years, those same incentives. Now, Representative Daniel Daniels was talking about adding incentives for oil. Do you think we should pull back on some of those incentives to do th more things with movies or any other industries? Chris, I'm sorry, Charles, Charles. Yeah, I, I think we should. Uh, the, the, the direction we need to be heading in is, like, like, like you know, we watched from the video, the, the oil is running out. I mean, our, our wells on decline. We have to look to some other sort. We don't have a choice. Uh, 20 or 30 years, that's not a lot of time to build an entire another industry, you know, like we need to do. So, yeah, we're going to have to uh, cut back on that and start moving towards some, something else. I mean, there's people smart enough out there to find out what that is, you know, but oil and gas, I mean, it's, it's not it. It's, it's, de it's, a deplete, it's depleting. So Now, w when I go to the gas station, I, I think we should be in oil and gas more. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but, as, you know, as I fill up the pump and I know somebody's getting that money, are, are you sure we shouldn't spend that money to get more companies here or get more of those profits to stay here? Kev? I think we're looking at a catch-22 situation um, because we've, we've relied on oil and gas and one of the main things when I've talked to people being an educator is the fact that education is what the oil and gas industry looks at when they want to move here. You know, what type of education system do we provide? And then sometimes that tells them they don't want to be here, you know, and then other times it says it does. So everything is interconnected. And as far as cutting back, we have to maintain what we have. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's feasible for us to expand the coastline out there as far as more drilling and that. Um, because most of our oil we get is from overseas, all right? It, it's not what we're producing here, it's what we're refining. And so um, the only thing that's hurting us is natural gas, all right? And so, and again, if I'm looking at it correctly, the reason our natural gas, is, gas prices went up is because of the government. You know, it's not because we have less of it anymore, you know, we still have the same amount we've been using, but it's doubled, you know, more than doubled than what the price was. So that's where you have to go back and look at Congress and say, what are your desires? You know, what do you want for this state? And, and they have an agenda, and their agenda needs to be more in the line of diversity. Do we need to add more incentives for more, more natural gas drilling? Would that be the answer? Isn't that what happened back in the 80s and the 70s when, you know, why is it that Louisiana gets paid for three miles out and Texas gets paid for 10 miles out? I mean, isn't that, wasn't that an incentive or I don't know how that came about, but that's kind of shocking. Well, uh, are we getting our money's worth right. from the oil and gas industry? What do you no. think? No. No. Go ahead, Barbara. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's one of the main problems is, uh, <clears throat> is that we're not getting enough per barrel or whatever we make here, refine here. Now there's been something percolating through the legislature that says that we need to switch and we need to 
levy more taxes on processing. And so as we refine more and it goes through our state's lines, we need to take some of that money. Is that the, the right solution for this problem? It's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you levy more taxes on, on uh, production. Uh, the companies that do the refining of, of the production of the oil and natural gas are just going to uh, carry that yeah. cost over to the consumer. That's right. Mm -hmm. find somewhere else. The trouble mm -hmm. is companies are not limited anymore. Everybody's global. So yeah. if it costs too much in Louisiana, they just go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you know? It just it seems strange that we've got all these resources here and we're going to let them go. Is that the best thing? I mean, should we really get off of this horse and move on? They're going whether you want them to go or not. Yeah. And we're not, we're not going to sit there. I, I, I'd say it's like keeping the light burning until we get something else going. Yeah. Okay, it's going to be there. Let's take it, let's realize it's, it's near its end, and let's plan for something else like, 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 like movies or, you know, like we're going to a service industry. What can Louisiana do? We're, we're good for food. Exactly. We're good for lumber. We're good for any number of natural resources other than this. We, we don't have to go away from it. We just have to realize it's going away from us. Should the legislature help us move in that direction? And what steps do you want your elected officials to where do you want them to go to help us move for the next 20 years? What do you think they should do? Well, some, somebody has to come up with a plan, some type of, some type of transition plan. Because, I mean, it's, it's going to take a long time. Whatever we decide on doing, whatever's going to replace that much revenue, is going to take a while. So we have to get that ball rolling now. I mean, we keep what we have. Like, like uh, uh, Mr. Chris said, I mean, we keep what we have going, but we start doing other things so that when, it's, when it comes around that time where it's really getting tight with the oil and gas, we're already ready for the next, you know, 100 years. We, we have to get started now. Or we're going to be behind everyone else. We already are. Okay. And we have to start looking to more than one, you know, one other, you know, place to go, you know, not just movies, you know, maybe into, you know, entertainment or to, you know, um, customer service, some know, you get tax breaks, you know, you um, attract jobs to the state, you know, companies will come, you know, if, you know, if you're giving more tax breaks than other states, oh, they're going to come down here, you know, if they start looking at, you know, the people, the workers down here are getting more educated, you know, they're going to start coming down here, you know, the wages will start, you know, rising and stuff, you know, then it's, the state's going to do a whole lot better, you know, they won't get, you know, pushed back into the wall where we just want oil and gas, you know, that's our bread and butter. If that doesn't, I mean, that's going to work, you know, there's no backup plan, you know, there's nothing else but all because that's good to us, you know. We always have to diversify and always look to other means because, you know, just like life, you know, it's not going to be there forever, you know. It's always something that you can always diversify to that's going to help the state to grow, you know, and to get it out there, you know. Louisiana itself has a lot of things that are, you know, as they say, you know, we have culture, we have a lot of history, you know, but that's getting overshadowed by just, you know, all and, you know, all in the refineries and things like that. You know, California, you don't hear too much about the natural resource. You hear about, you know, their music, the movies, you know, everybody wants to go to Hollywood, you know, but we need to do something to keep our people in Louisiana. You know, every time some I graduate, I mean, I went to Grambling State, you know, when people graduate, they're not talking about Louisiana, you know, they're talking about going to Texas or Atlanta or going, you know, abroad to better paying jobs, you know. We need to keep our people in Louisiana, you know, keep them educated, and that way, you know, Louisiana will grow not only you no know, person by person, but as a city, you know, collectively. I think I understand, but are we shooting ourselves in the foot by shooing away the, the highest paying jobs? I mean, if the highest paying jobs are coming from the petrochemical industry, are we sending them the right message by saying that we're moving on? Your, your, as I remember, your, your jobs are $26.50 an hour in the chemical plant. Uh, Walmart to nine bucks, nine fifty an hour. The chemical plants, they're getting fewer and fewer people. Years ago, they did bulk chemicals here. They don't do that anymore. Now they do special chemicals. They have a small plant that'll make a little bit of that. Bulk chemicals are going with the labor is a great deal cheaper. We've already thrown ourselves out of that marketplace. So to sit there and say we're going to lose these twenty-six dollars an hour job, that's that's not true. We don't have that many of them to begin with. Yep. You know, it's something that he doesn't have, he doesn't have, I don't have, and you don't have. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So. Uh, we don't use that as a barometer. We go from there and say, okay, what, do, what can we do to make our population have a decent living, I think. Chris? I think we saw it in the 1980s. Uh, at one time, you could go down Pardras Avenue in New Orleans, and most of the major oil companies were headquartered in New Orleans. Yeah. I don't believe that 
there is one oil company that has a headquarters in New Orleans anymore. Um, I think that the, the only really new industry that we're brought into the state within the last two or three years of a man of manufacturing type uh, design is the tank car uh, facility that's going into Alexandria, Louisiana. Uh, we've lost out with uh, automotive producers, uh, have looked at Louisiana, but have gone to other states, Alabama, I, I believe Mississippi has a plant opening. Uh, we do have a GM plant up in Shreveport, and I think some companies would come here, but they are looking at the quality of life, uh, the education, the overall economic picture of the state before they make a major investment into Louisiana. Uh, the situation has got to be diversified. We've got to bring in these industries in, or we're going to we're going to continue to lose our best and brightest out of the state. Just like Charles said, the people are going to go to where they can make a, a decent living and have a, a, a have a decent lifestyle. Now, I, I remember the '80s where. Louisiana was the place to be, where oil and exploration drove the industry, drove the state, where you could go down Poydras Avenue and see these businesses. And so, do we need to funnel money into exploration? Do we need to try and extend that that uh, the line from three miles to ten miles, or should we really walk away? We can't walk away. As long as there's machinery in this world, you will never shut oil and gas down. You need oil and gas to an extent, but you do have to diversify. But where I feel our main problem is, it's the old game in Louisiana, politics. There's too many deals cut on the state level that go to the national level that leaves us in the rear. Until we clean that pot, you're going to eat chicken the rest of your life rather than beef. <laughs> Charles, we, we're right next door to Texas. I mean, mega oil giant. I mean, known around the world. I mean, and we're always going to be the little brother to that anyway. I mean, it's, there's not, I mean, we don't have the, the square bowels to compete with them on a level as, as far as oil. It, not even offshore, as, you know, as they said. But I mean, what, what, what can we do about that? Do we want to stay in Texas' shadow? I mean, we share a border with them. Do we want to stay in their shadow? for, you know, the rest of our existence as a state, or do we want to find our own identity with something, a product that we can offer, something on that level? I mean, it's, that's the, where the exploration needs to be with something else. Because we, we, we share a border with them, oil is never going to be a problem with us. You know, we have our, and then we have our own supply, so we can supply ourselves for that, you know. But as far as something else to put us on the le economic level that Texas is on right now, because their, their jobs are doing good. A, a lot of my friends, they graduated from college. They, they're in Texas now. I mean, I have to drive across the border to go see them. And it's all because of they, they, the same job here doesn't pay the same right across the border there. Dana, what do you think? I totally agree with Charles. Um, I have several friends. Um, you know, I'm 33 years old, and uh, most of my friends that I went to school with are gone because of the, the quality of life and the jobs available. And, um, you know, I, I think we're caught in a trick bag where I see, you know, we still need to um, not forget our roots and um, what has gotten us to this point, but also to diversify and um, have a vision. If you don't have vision, you know, you're not going anywhere. But now Texas, I think, had a vision, and they used oil to fund education. They used oil to fund roads. But Texas had a bigger political exactly. pull than we mm. do. Mm. Texas, I worked for the refinery for 22 years. Texas has, if you want to call it, they got more oil wells than we do, but they don't have any more oil than we do. Louisiana was probably one of the most oil-producing states, and I'm talking about sweet, what they call sweet crude. Texas is foul crude. Mm -hmm. Their politicians got the line pushed out 10 miles. What did our politicians do? Mm -hmm. Nothing. You know. We need to, and I say we, I'm talking about everybody in this room and everybody outside this room, elect the people that will protect the people. And, have our and, best and quit the old crony business. 
killer with Jerry Powell. What three things would you want your elected officials to do in terms of the oil and gas policy for Louisiana? First of all, I wouldn't want them to change anything that's ch that we have at the present. It's just to, to pick up and go forward. Use the oil and gas industry to get us m more plants. There's textiles. There's, uh, Mississippi has a Nissan plant. Oh, I can't tell you how big that thing is, but I tell you what, it probably covers a couple, <coughs> I'd say, eight or nine square miles of territory. There's a boulevard, Nissan Boulevard, in Mississippi, on the other side of Jackson. I mean, but you still got to have oil and gas. You know, it's there. But entertainment industry, we can capture that. We already showed we can do it. Uh, Union Tank Oil, like I said, Chris just said, they, they saw a good deal. If we put our best foot forward and look out for the people, we'll have no problem. Chris, what do you think? I think the, the problem with uh, why we lost jobs in Louisiana with the, the headquarters of the oil and natural gas companies, petrochemical companies moving out, was that they were the major players in the economy here. State, local governments tax them to the nth degree. Texas, on the other hand, cut state and local tax breaks to those companies and lured them out of Louisiana, and they went to Dallas, Houston, and into Texas. The, uh, the situation is that we have to bring husband the resources that we have, the jobs and the, and the companies that we have, use the tax base wisely to attract new business, and to, to improve the educational system in the state to draw companies here, not only for the population that we provide them with the workers, but also for the out-of-state uh, employees that are, will come with those uh, companies into the state. Uh, I don't know what else the, the state could do uh, other than to, to quit taxing these companies to the nth degree and, and, and expect to ride the mule till it drops. Deborah, you <laughs> nodding your head. I mean, because there was a move afoot recently, we were talking about the entertainment industry, that there were proposals to try to, you know, s Raise cut out the tax and said, you know, why would you want to kill the goose that's laying the golden eggs, you know, but we, send, have a, we tend to shoot ourselves in the foot here in Louisiana again and again and again, <laughs> you know. And I think part of that, again, has to go back to politics and the good old boy. Because after Katrina, you know, they had the, the session came in, you know, they had to call that emergency session, that they were paid to do that instead of saying, you know, let's not worry about being paid, let's just get the, 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 this state going again. But again, what did they argue about? Their pet projects. Yep. I mean, it had nothing to do with, with let's organize, let's do this, and, and let's get our state going forward. But no, they're going to sit and argue about pet projects and, well, I want my, my project funded. You know, well, I'm sorry. That's not putting the people of this state first. That's putting themselves first. And that's what I would like every congressman to do, you know, every representative to say, what's best for the state? Not for me, not for me getting reelected, but what's best for the state so we can get these companies back in here, and so we can keep too. our kids when they graduate from the universities. Because some of our brightest minds, they leave. They're not going to stay here in a state that bickers in politics all the time. Barbara? Talking about the entertainment part, in 1957 and 60, the first movies that were made here in Baton Rouge, I worked for the Labor Department, and for a while they had all the movies being made in Louisiana, but that all died out. It's just rearing its head again why when they were making money and bringing people to the state would they not continue to do it? <laughs> Does anybody have an answer for that? We told you several times. <laughs> <laughs> Either we're not talking, we're not listening. <laughs> what about a national policy? I, Kevin, I understand you were talking about we needed a, a policy, I guess statewide. Do we need a national policy for energy? Well, yeah. yeah, they should treat every state the same. That's a, that's a, that is a natural resource producing state, whether it's timber, oil, gas, I don't care what it is. That state ought to have the same rights and privileges as a state 
five states above them or five states below them. If Texas has got a 10-mile coast, why doesn't Louisiana have a 10-mile coast? Should we go to war to protect oil interests? Should go to war with Washington, but how are you going to beat Washington? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the things is that the, the royalties we should have been getting from natural gas and oil, and if I understood it right, was the fact that most of the other states got it siphoned off as, as it's piped on up there, and we don't get anything. And so when it comes to being fair, you know, that's where our legislature w failed us in a sense of saying, you know, we need to make sure that we maintain this amount of royalty. You know, that's what's going to fund our coffers. Um, and we don't have anyone that's, that's doing that. Well, you know, that's what I'm talking about, being fair. I was in the service, and when I was in the service in the state of Rhode Island, I lived on Navy housing. We had natural gas for our heat because we were Navy housing, but the, the, if you want to call it the public, they had oil heaters. But our gas was from right here in this state, and we were paying less for the gas than you were here. Mm -hmm. You know why? Washington, D.C. It's guaranteed that they get gas. We will freeze in the dark before they do. May I make a comment? You asked about a national energy policy. Uh, I can remember in 1973, 74, especially 74, I was in Korea with the 2nd Infantry Division. We could not move our tanks because of oil shortage, fuel shortage. We couldn't heat the barracks because of fuel shortage. It gets quite cold in Korea. The, uh, there has not been an energy policy in this country since that oil crisis took place in 73. We're played like a fish on the lure. When we start doing things to do uh, technology to become more energy efficient, they drop the, the oil prices and they lure us back in to buying big cars. I love Madison Avenue. Uh, they want, to, want you to believe that you're not successful unless you're driving a 400, 500 horsepower automobile burning premium unleaded gas getting about 20 miles to the gallon. Uh, this is, it's totally ludicrous. Um, I look and see what Europe has done. You cannot travel 70 to 80 miles in Europe without seeing a nuclear reactor. Their homes are mostly electrically uh, run. They have electric transportation. Their trains are run on, on electricity. So when the oil prices go up, they're not as hurt as we are here in the United States. Uh, the high cost of energy. Uh, I have to tell you that the, we, we're looking at it in dollars and cents. Uh, having, having been in the Middle East uh, I'll, for, for a good portion of my life since 1985, uh, the cost are, in energy are not going to be measured simply by dollars and cents uh, because we've been in a war over oil since World War II. And the, the costs are now going to be measured in human lives. And this, the talk of going into Iran uh, because of their nuclear uh, proliferation. Uh, why haven't we built more nuclear reactors in this country? We have two that I know of in Louisiana alone, Waterford and, and Port, uh, Port Hudson. Uh, why did we not continue to build nuclear reactors in this country? I guess because of the environmentalists. Uh, I don't know. We all knew that this was coming. We all knew that oil and natural gas was, was going to be depleted at some time in the future. Maybe not in our lifetime, but certainly in our children's lifetime and their children's lifetime. Are we going to go to war over a natural resource that if we conserved and did technological changes in our own country, we could prevent that and become energy efficient? We're going to let you be the last word for this portion. Um, when we come back, we'll, we'll be joined by a panel of guests to further discuss the issue of oil and gas and Louisiana's economy. We're discussing the impact of the oil and gas industry on the state's economy tonight on Louisiana Public Square. Joining us now is our panel of experts, State Senator Craig Romero, 
Republican legislator from New Iberia and member of the Senate's Select Committee on Coastal Restoration and Flood Control. Dr. Lauren Scott, president of an economic consulting firm and former chairman of the Economics Department at LSU. Dr. Paul Tomple, professor of environmental studies at Louisiana State University and former secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality. And Jim Porter, president of the Louisiana Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association and former secretary of the Department of Natural Resources. Let's go to our participants for their questions. Mervyn, I, I wanted to start off with you. You had a couple of really interesting points as we ended the last part. Do you have any questions for our panel of experts today? Yes. <laughs> How can we get rid of our politicians we got now? <laughs> if we can never have an election, you can have the opportunity. <laughs> I know it's a little pun, but you see, that's my point. Our politicians don't protect Louisiana. They protect themselves. All I would ask any politician to do is the same thing I do. Get up and go to work and give an honest day's work and come home, enjoy what you've earned. Instead of cutting deals and selling our, our state out. That's all I ask of them. Uh, have we sold our state out or is there anything that we, are we doing the right thing or the wrong thing do you think for the state of Louisiana well, now and in the future? It's a matter of opinion. My wife and I have seven children, Mervyn. I get up in the morning, this morning I was delivering biscuits and donuts in my daily routine in the real job, as my children put it. Daddy has a real job in addition to politics. In the state legislature, it's a part-time job, and I take it that way. Although I do things all day related to the Senate business, I go out and make a living selling things. And I've got to take care of my children and raise them and provide for them, and hopefully they'll have things that I didn't have in my life. So I do just like you. I'm out there, I've got a real job, so it just depends on, you've got to take them one by one. That's a pretty generic statement, but a lot of people have that perception, Mervyn. And, uh, you know, I'm here to tell you my story, and I'm out there making a living side by side with you. Until uh, I got into government, I was in our family business, in the dump truck business. And I was the tire repair man, Mervyn, for about 15 years. <laughs> and then I got in government, and maybe I ought to be fixing tires again. You know, <laughs> I think about it a lot, to be honest with you, but uh, that's the world I lived in. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mervyn. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Bob, you had a couple of points earlier about the need to move away. Well, you, you take a, a, an overview of the gas and oil industry, and I'm not as smart as any of y'all, but we need about 83 million gallons a day, uh, barrels a day of oil. That's what we're getting. And the demand is going to, the demand already is better than our production. It's going to get, the gap is going to get bigger and bigger. And that's one of the things, and that's going to create higher prices for us. Okay, uh, that's my perception. I guess I'll, I'll give this to Mr. Scott, who's the economist or doctor. Okay. Well, well number one, I, actually, the 83 million barrels per day is actually worldwide. Worldwide, yeah, exactly. worldwide. Is it yeah, 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 that's, that's correct. Not uh, not U.S. or Louisiana. Yeah. But uh, actually, the data that I've seen indicate that we're actually moving uh, towards a situation where we're going to have even more oil. Uh, there's an outfit called the Cambridge Energy Research Associates that's done an analysis of every. Uh, oil uh, field in the world, and so it's, this is not based on speculation so much as it is on good, good geology, and they are saying between now and the year 2010, we're going to add, we're going to go from about 83 million barrels per day to about 101, 102 million barrels per day. Well, that's a fairly significant increase between now and 2010. Uh, now, what is happening is the higher oil prices are doing something that many people would like to have happen, that is uh, conservation. It's happening naturally. I think most economists are in favor of the natural way of conservation rather than imposing it on people. If you look what is happening, uh, for example, to, to uh, 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 SUV, uh, consumption in the United States has dropped off dramatically. Actually, if you look at China, China is a country that was consuming huge amounts of oil. I think in 2004, they were consuming about 14 percent more than they were the previous year. Uh, in the first five months of 2005, it was down 5 percent. I mean, not, not a slowdown by 5, but down absolutely 5 percent. And so the high oil and high natural gas prices are their, create their own ways of force, forcing us to conserve. And we're doing actually with SUVs the exact same thing we did back in the early 80s when the price of oil uh, went from around the 350 in the early 70s to $31, $37 per barrel 
uh, which would be about $72, $73 per barrel today's prices. And what did we all do? We went out and started buying smaller, more fuel-efficient cars, insulated our homes. We, did, we as, as consumers, did the natural thing we always do when prices get too high. That is, we start to conserve naturally. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm an old person. <laughs> I am too. Right? And, and, yeah, and, Paul was going to say so. I'm and it's, it's, it's okay. It's a conventional view. But I've got uh, a 10-year-old granddaughter who I'm crazy about, all right? 20 years from now, today, you, 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 all the smart people should be saying, 20 years from now, we're going to have some real problems. We should be getting atomic energy. That was brought up by, I, I think, mm -hmm. Chris. We should be. Do we're not doing that, are we? Or are we? And I don't know about it. Not enough. No, we're not. Uh, the view he just gave you is a conventional economic view. I think it's flat wrong. Uh, oil production is peaking this year, probably, or within the next few years. And it's going to start coming down after that. And demand is still rising very rapidly. So the gap gets bigger and bigger, and the prices start to go up. We're already seeing that. That's why the prices are up now. There will be little blips along the way. But you've seen the end of cheap oil, which means we've got to find some alternatives. Louisiana could certainly do a lot of that. I mean, it's an economic area. Wind farms all over the country are taking off, uh, <coughs> photovoltaics. We ought to be looking at renewable energies, and Louisiana could have a share in that. But we aren't doing anything to promote it here in Louisiana. In most states around the country, if you buy a photovoltaic set and put it on your roof, it generates electricity. California will pay half back. So it's, it's feasible. It's already feasible in many places. You ought to be doing it in New Orleans. So I think it's the end of oil, and hooking our economic wagon to that horse is exactly the wrong thing to do. Oil brought with it big costs. You know what some of those costs are. They're environmental. Uh, wetlands loss is much larger than uh, was estimated before. The studies by the Mineral Management Service says it's somewhere between 20 and 60 percent of our wetland loss is due to oil and gas development. So we had these huge costs. That's why we're a poor state. If oil was going to give us these huge windfalls, we wouldn't be the poorest or second poorest state in the nation. Actually, so we're the 42nd there's got to be other poorest. ways to go. Actually, we're the 42nd poorest, and we would actually be the poorest if it wasn't for oil. Our poverty if rate you want to know what we would look like without oil, the United all you have States. to do is look one state to the east. Yeah. That's what exactly what we'd be like without oil. In my opinion, the uh, petrochemical <coughs> industry is our industry in the state of Louisiana. It is Not what anymore. we well, it is what we wrote. It can still be, I believe, if we look at LPG. However. What would you propose that uh, that it be then, if it's not, well, I'm not petrochemical? I'm not saying Maybe they should we leave. I'm just get saying some peanut farms. No, I'm saying we should look to other, more viable sources of income. And if you're going to have Such chemical as? industry here, well, I'm getting to it. If you're going to have chemical industry here, let's put a tax on that oil and gas coming from offshore. Not not what's produced in Louisiana, but offshore as it comes into the state. We bear costs because of the industry here. Pollution is just one of those costs. We should be compensated for that. So an oil and gas processing tax would be a smart thing to do. There's going to be a bunch of ports offshore. They're going to be bringing in natural gas. We're going to process it. We ought to be paid for that. That's how you fund government in Louisiana. And then you, you look further ahead. You've already mentioned cultural things. You've mentioned uh, movies. Those are all fine. We need to improve our educational system, build the infrastructure, create a good quality of life. Jobs will come. That's how it's worked in the West Coast. It could work here, too. Every, every tax reform commission ever in the state the last 10, 15 years has looked at the, ta the oil processing tax and said it is a stupid tax. That's because you've been telling them that. That's right. We've been telling them that because you cannot have one state that has an oil processing tax. If you do that, I mean, because the, the, the oil is going to come in and be refined at our refineries at a higher price than all the other refineries in the, in the United States. They can't move. Huh? Not yeah, oh, anywhere. but they oh, can, they oh, but they can they move, they and they certainly move. cannot expand. The pipelines uh, can't move, the refineries can't uh, move. Oh, of course move. pipelines can move. They're I mean, moving I mean, them right now. I was going to say, Mr. Porter, please help First, I'm glad to hear Dr. Pompey say that we shouldn't leave the state. Did you want this to be lively? Most every time else, you get the impression that we shouldn't leave the state. But I think it's exactly as Dr. Scott has said. What happens is, is if you pass a processing tax, that falls on here in Louisiana. That cost will be passed on to the citizens of Louisiana. What happens? They won't. Those refineries won't move, but they will not get new projects. And if you don't stay innovative, if you get, keep making investments, then eventually that's just like a tomato on a vine. If you don't get watered, it's going to welter away. That's what would happen to the industry if we don't. Uh, Dr. Scott already mentioned one thing that would happen. We'd become more efficient in the way we use oil and gas. We're the least efficient state in the nation. <laughs> Least efficient. You know what happens when prices start to go up to the least efficient state? 
you have hard times, and that's what we're facing right now. How are we the Chris. least efficient state in the nation? Can I can we get say, to ask questions? Sure, you get to ask questions. And how are we the least? How Chris do you measure that? Energy intensity, the amount of energy it takes to make a dollar. We're two and a half times the U.S. average. Well, that's because of the nature of the industries that we have. We're, we're, <laughs> we're twice Texas. Well, we've got Texas a question from like Chris over here. <laughs> but we haven't built a new refinery in the United States in, what, 17 <laughs> years? 30 years. 30 years. 30 years. So where is it going to be refined? How long does it take from the time permits are cut to the time actual construction starts to completion and raw crude goes through a refinery till it starts producing? Same thing. How long does it take from the time permits are obtained and construction starts to a, to a nuclear power plant is producing uh, energy? And if we're looking at 20 years down the road of an oil crisis beyond what we we, we want to picture in our own minds where where wars worse than what we're fighting now could be will be fought should we not now start looking at alternative fuels and alternative industry for the Louisiana absolutely yeah that's what we ought to be doing I don't think we need more refineries by the way because Industry would have built them, but they also see that crude will begin peaking and then dropping. Well, where is industry no, I mean, building the refineries that's being built right now? We don't, well, they aren't building any. Of that's the point. Well, they are. It's actually, there's, are. There's, there's one doubling its size just north of uh, it, uh, New Orleans. Okay. Uh, the, what is it? Marathon? Yeah, it's not a new refinery. Marathon. Right. Talking about in, not well, in the United States. I'm talking about outside oh, no, I'm talking the continental about the US. United States. Right. Most of them are in the US. outside yeah. Why? Yes. Because of environmental issues, it's easier to permit. It doesn't have the long it's lead cheaper. time that Chris mm -hmm. was talking about. You're looking at five to six years right. before you bring any of those projects online. Why are we letting them do that? Cheap labor. That's, that's Why are we letting? It's the economics. The econ that's right. The economics. International economics. Right. So they go across the pond. They build their refineries. Do the prices come down? Mm. -mm. No. It's a. It's just like cheaper. It. Why not? It's a well, com it's they a make commodity. better profits. <laughs> the but profits are better. Realize we're, we're importing 60 percent of the oil that we consume in the U.S. today. Right. And that, so that's the, that's the driving force. One of the, the reasons why the investments are not being, they're being made here, but the refineries have been able to de-bottle, and we are having some major additions come on. You'll see more of that activity where existing refineries <coughs> will be expanded. <coughs> Another thing I'd like to ask the panel as a whole, Chris brought it up earlier. He was in Korea. I was in Germany. I watched Mercedes, big cars on the Autobahn, all over the streets of Germany. Their cars are two to three times efficient what we got here, gas mileage, and they're bigger and nicer cars. Why, and I'm going back to the educational part here, where are our bright people going to? Why can't we do that here? Now, we taught the Japanese electronics, we taught the Germans ironworks. Why can't we do that here? Take the oil and gas industry we have and diversify it into everything else. Well, number one, I'm not aware of the cars being that much more efficient. Yeah. I am. Oh, oh, I, 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 I think have, that's impossible. I have been no there. Offense, but that's impossible. I have been it's there, and I have flat filled flat up the tanks with those cars. Well, it's, it's more expensive no, now, because when I was oh, there, and I'm talking possible. 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I, three times the car. 10 years ago, gasoline was $3 no, a gallon in Germany. I think what he might be referring to is there are more diesel-powered cars in Europe, than, the, especially in German, Germany, oh, yeah, Mercedes diesels, than they are in the United States which I understand that now the U.S. car manufacturers want to start looking very seriously about importing more diesel engines uh, into the United States and building more diesel-powered cars in the United States. I assume you wouldn't like that, right? I mean, no. diesel, diesel is way more polluting than No, no, they're gasoline. clean. They're clean now. They're clean. If you can new, meet the new sulfur standards. Yeah. Diesel. yeah, but you guys can do that, right? That's not <laughs> happening today. You look like you wanted to jump in and walk us here. Well, one of the things that I, <clears throat> I'm hearing and the reason that we're losing industry to uh, the, the uh, third world countries is because they now have more natural gas and it's cheaper <coughs> type thing. But at the price of what? At the price of the environment. You know, that's one reason why the petrochemical people had faced when they decided to cut through our wetlands, you know, and that at, at that time, the environment was not considered that much. But now with the Katrina and, and all of that, we have devastated our fishing industry. You know, we've lost more land mass now because of that. And so 
we will feel the effects in the environment even if they refine it over there eventually, just like we did when Canada's plants, um, all their smog and everything came over and fell in as acid rain in the United States. You know, so we will suffer the consequences, but I'm in favor of keeping the environmental standards where they are. And we have enough bright minds in the, in the petrochemical industry to figure out a way to do that. Maybe, gentlemen, can the oil industry coexist with environmental issues? Or, or can we balance both? Sure, they have for years. And I think you can see that happening in the Gulf of Mexico. We have coexisted. In fact, uh, a lot of the fisheries have been, been enhanced by the rigs that are out there today, by the, by the platforms. So, yes, we can coexist. Did you notice that these two storms, Katrina and Rita, came right through the heart of the offshore oil and gas extraction industry, right through the heart of it? and virtually all the spills were onshore, not offshore. Very little spills. Matter of fact, the, the total number of spills in general was a relatively small number given the fact the size of these storms. I think it's a great testament to what they've done in terms of technology in protecting the environment from spills. There are impacts from oil and gas. They can be managed, I think. <coughs> uh, it, does, it will take a strong DEQ and a strong governor to support it. Um, we haven't often had that, but we have had it on occasion. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> What's the situation, uh, like, so for instance, in Texas? So there are other situations similar to Louisiana's where the offshore uh, pipelines, you know, impact Louisiana, but in other states, there's no uh, tax imposed, there's no penalties or revenues imposed. L let me are mention the one thing. When it was a talk about a pipeline or a processing tax, decisions to refine oil because of the intricate pipeline system in the United States. 12% of all the foreign oil that comes into the United States flows through the Louisiana offshore oil port through Loop. And the intricacy from the pipeline from the facility in Galliano, Louisiana, in South Louisiana, you can flow oil all the way to refineries in Canada, in New England. They're connected. If you look at it, they're all over each other. It's almost a complete blockout in the, in the southern half of the United States. But decisions to refine oil in the United States are based on fractions of a penny. Not pennies, nickels, or dollars, fractions of one penny. They decide whether or not to refine in Port Arthur, right across the border, or in Baton Rouge, or the Marathon Refinery, or up in New England. So it's, it's, it's so minuscule, you have to pay close attention, because any time a state puts anything, if we put a fraction of a penny on a barrel of oil, then that decision is they're going to just turn that valve and flow that oil to a refinery in a neighboring state. That's how sensitive it is to pricing. And oil is priced globally unlike natural gas. Uh, the example a while ago about China. You know, China, just, just seven or eight years ago, China's oil, daily oil consumption was $2 million, two million barrels a day. Today, it's six million barrels a day. Ownership of vehicles is, has more than 10 times increased over in the last four years alone. Since the free trade agreements, North American free trade agreement, NAFTA has been enacted, China is becoming industrialized. Price of concrete has gone up, price of steel, buy anything made with steel. Concrete in your foundation of your house or a sidewalk. Call the concrete company. It's at an all-time high. It's just like oil. It's a commodity. And because of the growth of China, they're desiring to industrialize. They, their, their thirst and their hunger for goods is driving the price up. And oil is one of those commodities. Four million barrels a day increase in less than eight years. Just one point on the processing tax. Uh, the proposal has been over a dollar per barrel for oil that comes through the state. If you can move oil around the world for a dollar a barrel, there's certainly going to be ways that you can go around Louisiana. Yeah, In fact, tell the whole story. Mo most companies have contingency plans that they can move around the state of Louisiana within two years. So, I mean, that's not going to, con once you pass a process tax, no assurance that you'll continue to collect that tax. But they were going to relax the other tax, the uh, severance tax. So it's not a net one dollar increase. And it would, in actuality, it probably wound up to a few pennies, and I don't think, I think the oil companies will tell you that they will go somewhere else, but I don't think they will. And the thing is, Louisiana is getting poorer all the time, and we need the revenues, and we have the highest set of subsidies actually, in the United States. Of all states, we pay more subsidies than anybody else. Actually, just, yeah, just the discussions of the natural gas processing tax has reduced our, uh, the expansion of Sitgo, for example. You go talk to the refineries in Lake Charles, they will tell you that they have Sitgo plants all over the They have Conoco plants all over the United States. They can either expand there or they can expand, expand in Lake Charles. Just our discussions 
of the oil processing tax has sent projects to other states. That's scare tactics. I don't believe any of well, well, I mean, why, why have the major oil why, why isn't that just basic economics? So, it's not basic economics. Well, oh. Someone earlier on the panel mentioned that there are no major oil company offices left in Louisiana. Right. You know, right. the, maybe it was you, Chris, but they have exited. Mm -hmm. I know Shell is still, but I think they still have a building. It has nothing to do with that Shell taxing Bronx, structure. But the offices have already the left and they've relocated Houston. those high paying engineering type jobs out of New Orleans. New Orleans was, you, a you could go to New Orleans and you'd stay there a week to make sales calls. You can't attract week. jobs by giving away everything you have, and that's what you're suggesting. That we give them huge subsidies just, so no, they bring a few jobs here. No We've tried that, it subsidies. doesn't work. We've no. been doing that for 50 well, years. Me, it you're doesn't not work. talking about subsidies, you're talking about an additional onerous tax on that industry. No. What drove out a lot of the oil company headquarters out of New Orleans was not taxes per se on the oil refinery, refineries or the production or, or anything like that. What drove the oil companies out of New Orleans was poor educational system. I agree. The other thing were the tax incentives made by the state of Texas and also the imposition of a square footage tax fee on the office space that those oil companies were occupying in New Orleans. By the city. Now, by now, the city. Chris, you got the last word in on the first half, and I'm, I'm afraid <laughs> to say that you're going to have to get the last word in on, on the second half. We want to thank our panelists, uh, Senator Craig Romero, Dr. Scott, Dr. Tom Play, and Mr. Porter, for joining us tonight. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. A, a lively discussion from our discussants, a lively discussion from our experts. I think it really shows how much we all care about oil and gas and the perplex perplexing questions that we have as we move into the future. That's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We invite you to take our online survey about the impact of, oil and gas, of the oil and gas industry on the state's economy by going to lpb.org. Next month, how good a job is the state doing promoting and protecting the golden goose of our state, its cultural heritage? Join us for the business of culture, Louisiana's cultural economy. Thanks for watching, and good night. A home video of this program is available. For more information, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.